the cultural sector that's not what Germany actually likes, looks like. And I'm sorry to do this in the UK, I have to mention the war. Um, it's a, a result of the Potsdam Agreement uh, taking place in 1945, where one of the central governing principles was decentralization, especially in the cultural sector. And so we're not talking about Germany as a whole, but about 16 different states which each has a culture ministry, uh, which is also responsible for education, because in Germany the culture is a little bit broader. Uh, so schools and universities and uh, uh, cultural institutions are all in the, in the realm of this ministry. And so you can imagine there's a lot of uh, coordination efforts to be made. And um, that's the main reason why there's no federal digitization program yet. There have been lots of projects and there's a lot of digitization going on. There are digitization centers and large libraries, but uh, there's no centrally orchestrated, orchestrated uh, program how to digitize uh, Germany's digital heritage uh, and how to digitize Germany's cultural heritage. Um, but there's movement, and as uh, you see uh, above, there's Berlin, uh, the small switch, uh, and this uh, is the Berlin's. Uh, Center for Service Center for Digitization, and its head, Thorsten Koch, will tell you more about the challenges that cultural uh, institutions face when dealing with digitization. Thank you. Um, actually, what's in Germany is there is a central place to put all the digitized material in this German uh, digital library. So they made the plan to say, okay, all the stuff goes there, but where does it come from? Where do you get the Glam guys to get digital? This is where Gigis comes into play because the Berlin government had, I mean, they are not the cleverest usually, but sometimes they have some ideas or they made a concept. The concept says we have to do something about it, otherwise, we will not get our cultural heritage digital. And this is what Gigis is about. We are to push them, as we are, they are accustomed to getting people to them, coming to them, not standing away and waiting. And we are getting to them, telling them how to digitize stuff. Actually, we are not digitizing, but we're giving them money to do so. And we tell them how to do the metadata, how to do the formats, all the stuff. Um, we help them to put this forward. Problem is, as you see, there's this little Berlin there, which has a lot of cultural uh, institutions. But problem is, most of some of them belong to the federal state of Berlin, some to the, uh, to the federal government, some are foundations, some to the city of Berlin, and we are only responsible for the city. Nevertheless, we are pretty much working on it and trying to get this going, and we have to explain to them why this is useful to go digital. I, I go to them and then ask them, do you have photos of this? And are they digital? They say, yeah, yes, we did make photos of it, actually, and we have archived them. Uh, where? Oh, then they open a drawer and some dust comes up and then they find an old USB drive and it's all on this here. How long is this lying there? Maybe a year. Okay. And they bring it to us. We have large uh, tape libraries in the cellar where we can store several petabytes of data. And so we are archiving all the stuff, make sure there's uh, suitable metadata there, and then push it all up to the German Digital Library to get it running actually. This is our mission there. And here you go. Thanks, Dawson. Yeah, uh, I won't talk much about the German Digital Library. I'm uh, sure everybody in the room is familiar with Europe Ghana. And what we're doing is practically the same thing on the national level, and we're also aggregating the metadata for Europe Ghana. Um, yeah, as Elena said, uh, this was a quite a success. So our job was to talk to the uh, institution and to convince, convince them to participate, <coughs> and we uh, went quite well. And as you can see, I've uh, brought it down uh, to the sub sections, uh, sub, sub sectors of the cultural sector, and especially libraries, museums, and uh, uh, projects and institutions uh, dealing with research were quite active and, and uh, joined in. But there are also sparsely populated columns, and there's a gap in the monument preservation agency uh, sector. And uh, I actually talked to several of those agencies and got the um, reply, uh, uh, we're a proper German office, we don't cooperate with hackers. And, um, <laughs> I think that's one concern we can uh, easily resolve and in the next year we can tell them about the first edition of Kodi Da Vinci and they will get a clear uh, picture about what a hackathon is but there still is uh, some reservation and maybe if you're thinking about doing this yourself
yourself, you could come up with a better name or do some more explaining than we had time for. Um, of course, the biggest issue uh, uh, are the legal uh, uh, matters, and we can't do only so much about that, but there still is the need, as Elena said, to educate, to educate, to educate, because I think the fear, that's, the real fear that's driving these institutions is, uh, stems mainly from, from, from uh, insufficient knowledge, and that's never a good uh, foundation. And also, they were quite reluctant. Mm, what, what is in it for us? Uh, what may be the outcome? Is these those apps you're talking about? Are they professional? Uh, can we show them around? Uh, yeah, we'll come to that. Um, um, I was just that's an, as an impression. Um, what the richness and variety of the data that was available. Um, you can. Uh, go to the Coding Da Vinci website and have a look yourself. We have 3D data, audio, maps, photographs, and some of those you will find uh, uh, later on in the presentation. Yeah, and it's time to add uh, the presenting to back to Thorsten, and no one would be better suited to tell you about the uh, outcome of the uh, uh, hackathon than uh, the tallest member of the jury, uh, which handed out the prizes. Thank you so much. Um, before I tell you what actually happens at the jury, I just want to go a few slides back to this year again, because this is extremely important. If you go to a small institution, um, they have a lot of fear about legal repercussions. And you say, you put this on the internet, so everybody will see us, see this. So who has the rights to a photograph? Who has the rights to an original object? There are a lot of things like everyday objects in museums where nobody ever cared about who produced this pot or something like that, but now some lawyer can come and say, oh, this pot bottle was produced in this factory, who is not function functional anymore, but the, the inheritors have the right still, and they want some money or something like this. And this is what they fear. And um, uncertainly about the beneficial outcome, when we came to them, we asked them to put everything on the internet, and they said, no, because what they do is usually they make an exhibition, make a catalog from it with nicely printed <coughs> pictures and text and everything, actually exactly what you want to have on the internet, in Wikipedia or something like that, and then they sell it. And they say, well, we get some money from it, so we want to keep this. And you have to convince them that there's more to exhibitions than having a catalog, maybe print 500 pieces of it and sell it. And so the, the hackathon actually is a very good way to show them that lots of things can be done with their data far beyond what they ever imagined. And um, yeah, so we come to the categories, which was most technical, most useful, best design, out of competition, and funniest hack. And the truth is, um, this were very good categories, and they were pretty much arbitrary. Because for most of the stuff we had, we could choose whatever <coughs> we had. I mean, if you have the funniest hack, it would be well, probably not most useful, but maybe most technical. And the best design might be most useful, and you could interchange. So actually, if you look at all the, the um, <coughs> participants, and funny enough, um, we agreed on just on the list of people who deserve to get the award. And then we look for the category. Sorry, guys, but uh, it's <laughs> <laughs> And it uh, was, was great fun, but actually, it's not difficult. I mean, if you have a lot of people there, of course, they all deserve to get something. But it's, it's astonishingly easy to decide the ranking list on, on things you, you like. And if we had then the things here were all the winners, they got some prizes, and yeah, it was a lot of fun. Um, just to give you an impression what never ever anybody would have imagined, um, the Museum of Natural History in Berlin has some six million bucks in their collection. <laughs> Actually, this is a great thing because they want to digitize them all. And on the uh, German uh, Digital Library, we are competing with the other states on the number of objects put in. For example, the Bavarians have this Google project where they do all the, the, the papers and books, but we have the bugs. We will swap them with bugs, and then the six million objects will go and delete. And um, so what you can do here is basically, uh, well, somebody came up with this. They, they took the, the picture of some of the bugs and um, produced this object here, which could not only move, was Arduino based. It could not only move, but what actually uh, it, it had a, a, a show. I mean, when you play music, it, it started to dance. Thank you.
toned down because it was contaminated with asbestos. And now I, they are actually talking about rebuilding the Imperial Palace at least in the past. So you can see that some places have a very uh, moving history with a lot of things uh, changed. Um, one image I wanted to show you is... So this is near um, Alexanderplatz, which is a large um, public square in uh, Berlin. And you can see in the background here there's a little bridge. But if you go to present day Alexanderplatz, there is no water or river or anything. So what, what I did to, to, to understand this, um, I actually um, took maps of that time and mapped this on a present day, um, um, overlaid this on a, on a present day map. And you can see here that there's a river and you don't understand why that is. Because there was a fortification built around Berlin. So this fortification was built in the 17th century. And if you go back in time again, you can see actually that it surrounded the entire city, right? And this fortification had water in front, so you needed a bridge to cross it. And um, yes. um, so if you go still earlier, so this is um, a very old view of um, basically the medieval wall. wall. So I, I was a bit interested in how you can see these historic traces still in, in present day Berlin. So what I did as I was kind of uh, mapping this uh, was mapping this on an outline. So first of all, you can see if you zoom out very, very much and zoom to today, and you see how the, the size changed right? like from a really small town to a huge, massive place. And this view, this is actually outlining um, a wall that was built uh, for customs purposes. Right? So uh, it, uh, there, there was um, an area where people had to um, uh, pay customs, and this was the wall they built for it. And you can see here that still this, this, this road follows um, exactly um, where this wall was. And if you go further to the river, um, there's actually a bridge called Oberbaumbrücke, which means Upper Beam Bridge. And there was literally a tree, a lot of tree in that, um, in, in that water to actually fence off that area so ships had to stop and pay their customs. So in the names and in the world, we still see those um, historic, um, his, uh, historic changes. Um, yeah. Time. 
Ambassadors and uh, as well for the National Science Museum uh, in Poland uh, to, to have the opportunity to, to make a simple project and to bring the kind of fun in the morning. data 
number of the objects that I have, that they are all in the process of uh, digitizing right now. Um, once you give that away and let crazy hackers play with the toys, as the phrase goes, um, suddenly it becomes apparent to them what kind of pressures they hold. And uh, so, yeah, we should definitely do it again.
technology question there. From the developer's point of view, do you have any feel for how many were able to use live APIs versus the kind of data dump and then had to work on the data and embellish it themselves to be able to deliver their product? Yeah, we have a huge variety of projects and we have shown the more uh, accessible ones, but there were really technical ones. We at the uh, German Digital Lab, we got a, a JavaScript framework for our API format and there were a German authority file uh, provided by the German National Library exposed also by uh, an API and that was used in many, many projects and also
introductions and what's going on in the panel here. Then um, James is going to talk very quickly about what Wikipedia has in the way of health content. Henry here is going to talk about how people look for medical information on the internet. I'm going to talk about the organisation I work for, Cancer Research UK, and how we provide information for some of those people. And then John here will talk about um, some research that we're going to be doing to look into answering some of these questions. So, uh, very quick introductions then. James, do you want to go first? Oh, yes. So, um, I'm James Milman. I'm an emergency physician, long term Wikipedia. Um, and uh, yes, I've been involved with Wikipedia for about seven to eight eight years, very active editor. Hi, I'm uh, John Byrne, I'm uh, usually user John Bard, uh, but I'm uh, Wikipedia resident at Cancer Research UK, and I have a bit of a that, uh, Wikipedia John, and I've been there for a long time, not a medical editor, but I do six months, seven months, four days a week at Cancer Research UK, uh, and that's obviously involved me right I work for Cancer Research UK in their own news and multimedia team. Cancer Research UK, for those of you who 
we've done some studies of uh, who uses this and why and what in what situation. Actually, turns out that the number of people who are actually recently diagnosed, actively being treated patients, almost paradoxically, is quite low. What it actually turns out that people who are reading this are the friends and relatives of people recently diagnosed, or nurses, doctors, uh, oncologists who want to find some information to give to their patients. So this stuff is ending up, the information itself is ending up with the patients, but maybe the patients aren't the actual primary users of the website. Over the years, with, with, when you were sort of working online content, you end up doing things like search and optimization and keyword analysis. And one of the things we spotted happening over the years was we were sort of ranking maybe one or two or three on the Google search results. There'd always be this other website alongside our, our, our outpatient information website, which is this thing called Wikipedia. And we sort of scratched our heads a bit. And our initial reaction to that, as you can probably understand coming from an organization that having engaged with Wikipedia at all, was how do we better optimize our site so that we can't buy Wikipedia? Or, or how do we discourage people from going to Wikipedia? And as you can probably tell, that wasn't the most productive way of doing things compared to sitting down, reaching out to Wikimedia UK and saying, can you tell us a bit more about how this website works? So, we have started this project, um, which has culminated in having a Wikipedia in residence and cancer association okay, to try and work out how we can better engage, how we can share some of our, our knowledge and expertise of the writing of patients, um, of writing of healthcare professionals as well, and try and improve this content. But one of the things that's, that's um, uh, one, one of why we're in this session is what we don't know is why people are using Wikipedia. We know why they come to our website, and we know the sorts of rough breakdowns of what people and we know that they do use 
want to initiate a fair discussion. Now we have basic approval from Wikisource, at least we can do some tests there. Yep. And the, the video bot has been running for a number of years on Commons, so basically the components are all there. And we want to demo it somewhere, uh, ideally in medical articles that are highly read. Um, and we want this also means that we would add to the typical reference information uh, that the full text of that reference is, is available on Wikisource, that the images are in Wikimedia Commons and so on. So yeah, you know, I, um, I think it's an, it's an excellent idea. Um, I, you know, one step further would be to create another namespace on, on Wikipedia called references and then actually, you know, type the reference over from, um, from Wikisource into Wikipedia itself so that those who are accessing Wikipedia via their cell phones in the developed world via Wikimedia Zero can then actually read the references this and this will be huge and um, Cochrane is actually tempted to release their content under an open license if we can make this happen. Well, this is actually uh, kind of happening already. Uh, Wikipedia Zero is changing their system. Initially, they uh, were kind of the accessless URL base, but now it will be based on the IP range, and so any Wikimedia server will be accepted that would include Wikisource. Wow, that and is so the problem. They are in the, in the process of transition, um, and so any project that starts new with Wikipedia Zero will have this configuration. The existing ones are being migrated. Right. Was, there, was there a question over there?
Spotify is different, it might be different if you have Twitch Prime. And uh, I was going to ask if you ever considered having a separate sort of wiki where patients themselves go ahead and kind of document their cases. Like what did they go through? I, like I what think kind we're running out of time. The short answer to that is, is no, because that's kind of well outside. I mean, there are, there are tons of sites like that. Uh, the, the web is absolutely full of sites like that. Uh, and I don't think Wikimedia will be uh, starting one up. Yeah. Uh, go, go, go to like disease forum. So, so yeah. you go to an ADA forum, you can go to an MS forum. And, and you know, it, there's, all these, there's all these endless pages uh, where, where, where people you know, speak about their symptoms, explain their stories, um, you know, and, and sort of you know, build a community around you know, their condition and get support for their condition. And you know, there's already, already lots of people doing it. And I agree with John, you know, I don't think this is something, you know, it's not really an encyclopedic style, or not something. I mean, so, you know, even as an another project, I think it's, it's, it's not something. Okay, let's just have one really quick. Um, when Beatrice in Wikimedia Commons, which might be Thank you. 